Good morning. Are you still having fun? Yeah. So what is BWSI? So how many of you want to start a company when you grow up? Raise your hands. Today is your lucky day. <laughs> it is my great pleasure to introduce Katie Ray. She is the uh, CEO and the managing director of the engine built by MIT. She'll tell us, she'll tell you all about what it means to start a company. Awesome. Get it? Oh, do you want to use Oh, that? yeah, no, 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 you're right. I have, is the lapel working? Yes. You guys can hear me? Okay, so I didn't believe that this place was going to be filled in five minutes, so it's amazing to see all of you here. And I wish, I, I always uh, say to my kids, I wish I knew there was engineering when I went to high school, because I didn't even know it was a thing, honestly, until late in college. And so, and what, what a great gift to be able to work with kind of the world's elites on all kinds of interesting problems to do with technology and our world. And, you know, I'm, what, I, what I thought I'd do since I heard this group has a ton of questions and awesome ones, is spend 15 or 20 minutes telling you about what I'm up to and then engage in a conversation however you want to about questions you have or things you want to create and how to do that. Happy to talk about anything. And, uh, and you know, I'm sure it'll be a fun discussion. So uh, I run something called The Engine. And this was founded a little over two years ago by MIT and really pushed out as a for-profit startup out of a university, which is like a crazy thing to do. So I, w I thought it would be really fun to take you through why a place like MIT would do this, and then what are the kinds of things that we're up to, and why I think it's really important to, the, to kind of the future of the world. And, um, and I, I try not to say that arrogantly, but I actually believe that. So. We invest and work with, I call them crazy founders, but I say that with love, right? These are people working on true engineering problems that could have a massive impact in the world. And they're people that work across all kinds of different problems, whether they're in health, or whether they're in energy, or whether they're in how we feed the world's people. But they're amazing people, almost all of them, have gone through middle school, high school, university, and then go on to get their PhDs in a very deep technical area, and then begin and found a company. And often, it's groups of people um, in diff from different PhD programs and business schools who come together around an idea. So I just want all of you to be thinking, it's. There's, there are no great single inventors in the world who have deep, deep impact. They all form teams in order to really bring that impact to the world. So doing what you're doing, working in teams around technology, is the core of being an entrepreneur. And so that, those are the types of people that I get to work with every single day. There are groups of engineers and business people who come together to form something extraordinary. So I'm going to take you back really uh, four, five, six, even six, seven years ago. Uh, a, an institution like MIT, like preeminent engineering school in the world, is sitting around looking at what kinds of things are being rolled out of this university as a company. And who's getting money and who's not getting money? Is that flickering now? Who's getting money and who's not getting money? So President Reif, who's the current president of MIT, and a real visionary on this, looked around and said, there's a lot of money going into software only. There's a lot of money going into pharmaceutical development, so drug discovery. So what's the, you know, what's the drug that could be used to cure, name any disease, Alzheimer, diabetes, et cetera. 
a lot of the money which supported startups were going into those two areas. But there were so many important inventions and things that could solve the world's biggest problems that were basically sitting on the shelf in a lab in one of our labs here at MIT. And when you look at those important inventions and you say, why isn't the current venture capital community supporting those inventions and creating companies? It's a really sad thing because you know the world needs these inventions, right? Whether it's how to massively scale how we feed the world's people, how to decarbonize you know, all of our electricity to our grid, et cetera. You don't want those things to sit on the shelf, but the current form of supporting them isn't working because they're what, what's called capital intensive businesses. And they're not capital intensive later, like almost all businesses. And by the way, if I'm talking about stuff you have no idea about, just listen, because you're gonna need to hear these things four, five, six times till they start to make sense. So you'll hear it once today and then, then you're gonna hear capital intensive later and you're gonna be like, oh yeah, that lady said something about that once. And it'll all start to make sense. Um, but to me, I had to hear it five or six times. So these are cap early stage capital intense businesses. They're things that are physical. They're things that require millions of dollars to take out the engineering risk in them to prove that you can create them. So Uber, I'll give you an example of a very successful company. Uber is an immensely capital intensive business. Think about how much money they've raised. Hundreds of billions of dollars. But in the very early stages of that company, they could prove that it would work because it's just software. They could prove that it was working with a very small amount of money. I'm talking about businesses that often need a larger amount of money in the beginning to prove they can work because we, don't, we can't prove today the engineering works. So I'll bet a lot of the things you're working on right now in your teams fall into that category. Right? The engineering isn't fully proven. And most things truly coming out of labs in universities fall into that category, except in the two that I mentioned in the beginning. So we set out to invent a better way to invest and support companies like that so that they could make it to the market. And um, what we created at the engine was really three things together. A fund, so we raised a little over $200 million. Uh, a network, and this is a network custom made for companies like this. So it's people who understand how to work on hardware companies, how to work on really big engineering feats that could be helpful, whether they're corporations or whether they're human beings that know how to do this. We put a large network together to help the companies. And then MIT did something extraordinary, which is it opened up its labs and infrastructure to these startups and said, if MIT has equipment or spaces that could be helpful to these startups, we want to let them use it. And so combining those three things, plus working very closely with the US government, we think that we have a way to support these companies in the early stage so they have a chance to prove out their engineering risk so that they can become enormous, impactful companies. Uh, we invest really into three giant areas. One is companies that could impact climate change. Then the other is companies that could truly impact human health. That's both how we cure disease, how we feed the world, et cetera. And then system capabilities. And these are things that are really, usually not very sexy to talk about, but super important. You know, think about the world of photonics or think about the world of semiconductors, like anything, or quantum computers. You know, all of those things are enabling to many of the other things that help the world run. So those are the three big areas that we invest into. 
because we think that those will become enormous, have enormous impact on the world. I'm going to take you through those companies in a little while, but that's, that is what we do. And the zone we play in is something that we call tough tech. And we think these are things that are transformative to the world, but often have a challenge because you're converging both science, engineering, and leadership in order to get them through to become an enormous company. And they go across all kinds of different areas. You know, and I've mentioned a few, energy, but also all the biotech, semiconductor, food, ag, deep software, quantum, advanced manufacturing. How many of you, when you look at those categories, know about what all those fields do? Does anybody understand all those fields? OK, cool. Awesome. So that means that you have so much to discover in the rest of high school and college, because I would say in all of these fields, there are so many important discoveries yet to happen and so many important companies to be founded. And so to me, the opportunity, since you already are at the cusp of the cutting edge of technology, your careers will be unbelievable because you're going to dive into all these types of areas. And the explosion of understanding in the next 50 years, which will be, or 60, 70 years, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you guys are going to live to 150. Probably you will. So let's say your careers are going to span 80, 90 years from now. What's going to happen over that time will be extraordinary because of the convergence of software and all of these what we call tough tech areas, which are just going to open up our understanding of the world and let us solve some of these really, really big problems. So what do I do every day? I literally evaluate teams and companies that I think can win, things that I think can have a big impact on the world, and I spend time helping them do it. So I'll just take you over the last two years. So we formed the fund about two years ago. We made our first investments last summer, uh, two summers ago. So exactly two years ago, we made seven investments. We now have 19 investments. In that short period of time, we've, we invested about $15 million, and they've raised another $250 million. If we came back a year from now, those companies will probably have raised $450 or $500 million. So you see that these things, if, if you found them and they're exciting, lots of people want to pile in and help those companies succeed. That's what we're trying to prove at the engine. So let me talk to you a little bit about what we look for in a founding team, because this is going to be really important. Like, if I had known this at your age, I think so much about how much more I could have gotten done in the last 30 years. So three really, really important pieces on forming any high-performant team or company is that you have to have a set of people with the span of needs that the company has. All of them include leadership skills. And I assume what you're doing in this Beaverworks camp is developing both your leadership and technical skills. So every company needs a mix of leadership, both business and technical, and the technical expertise around the table to tackle whatever problem you're going to go for. So when we look at who we want to spend time with, we look at does their team match the challenge that they are going after? And who is sitting around that table? So when you guys think about your problems, even in this camp setting where like, I heard you have competitions and things like that, you have to be thinking, who is sitting around your table to solve problems, and what are you each expert in? Because as one of my favorite mentors said to me, even if you're the smartest person in the world, you probably have three of the 10 skills 
that you need to be a gr great at anything. You definitely don't have 10. So that means you must find others that have your missing skill sets. So we look at that team and see is it fully formed. The second thing we look at is if they're successful, what, will, what they're doing, will it scale to a global level? So for instance, we're in a fusion company. Will that fusion company, if they succeed in their technology, be able to be something that has fusion power plants all over the world, yes or no? Right? And then do we believe what they're doing is between 100 and 1,000 times better than what we have today? Like we have to think it's a true, what they call it, kind of a step function change. So a massive change to the world. So that, those are the kind of companies we look for and kind of teams we look for. Um, this is maybe gonna sound ridiculous, but in our view, and you guys are all holding Lockheed Martin water bottles, right? Okay. And somebody has, where are the towels from? Are they from Lockheed Martin too? Okay, fine. Did you get somebody else last week? This is the first week. Okay, so you're gonna get something next week from another company and something next week from the company after, right? Okay, fine. My point is you're going to get stuff from big, massive companies. One of the really important things not to forget is that you, everybody thinks startups are competing with everyone. Actually, a lot of what we do is collaborate with those big, enormous companies like Lockheed Martin or Novartis, which does stuff in biotech. They actually collaborate with a lot of our companies because they can't do the kind of innovation that startups do. They can't take that extreme risk because they have shareholders that they have to return capital to. So startups can take that risk. So one of the things that we do at the engine is really try to bring these two groups together. Um, that's, that's all I need to say about that. Uh, the other things that we do are pull founders together so that they know each other. One of the greatest things about what you're doing here is you're going to meet a whole bunch of super smart people. Same when you're a founder of a company. You need 100 really smart early stage companies around you so that you can learn from each other. Um, so that's what we do at the engine is we bring people around who can help each other. And um, I'm going to skip that one and start to talk about some of our companies. So any questions on that before I dive into some of the companies that we're working on? And easy answer is no. OK, good. Uh, so I'm going to take you through maybe four or five of our companies so you can see kind of the breadth of things that we work on. So who here wants to work on a space company? Who wants to go to space? Space? OK, who believes they're going to be living, people will be living on Mars in your lifetime? I totally think your, maybe not my lifetime, but your lifetime. Um, we already found water, didn't we? So uh, this company, Analytical Space, is actually not going to Mars yet. but. We have an enormous amount of data that is being collected by all kinds of satellites up in space. But because we can't get that information down to Earth very efficiently or quickly, we don't get to really benefit from that data up in space. So if you think about rainfall patterns, or how vegetation is growing, or how cars are moving. You know, if we had all of that data, we could help all of those things go much, much more efficiently. But unlike what we have for um, on Earth, where we have routers that move our data very quickly, from space, we don't have those routers. So this is a company. And 
it would take me a lot longer to explain how they do it, but they're using laser technology. Who knows what, las like what lasers do? Okay, most of you, co cool. Um, they're using laser technology up in space. So they're launching a set of CubeSats, which are very inexpensive satellite technology, and laser technology to rapidly get data down to Earth. And so that means anybody who wants that data from, from uh, space will work with this company in order to get that very rapidly. So that's an example of a tough tech company. So for instance, in order for them to become a company, they had to have to prove, one, that they can create the technology that would bring data down to space. They also have to prove that they can launch into space with these things. So does anybody know how much it costs to take something up on what they call a payload into space? Do you think it's, OK, how much is it? Interesting. What, what do you think it is? So, um, so a payload is divided up into a whole bunch of different compartments, right? So a company, do you have a different answer? That's exactly right. So a company like this, for what they have to put up into space, each one costs about between 500000 and a million dollars. So if you're a founder of a company like this, first of all, you have to go raise that money plus a whole bunch more money so that you can assemble an engineering team and build this technology. And then you have to stand down on Earth and know that you're going to load probably a million dollar machine into the payload. And it's going to cost you another 750000 a million dollars to send it up into space. And you have a chance that that thing just blows up before it gets there. And then you're going to have to do it all again. So your investors, the people giving you that money, have to think that what you are creating is so outstanding that they should bear the risk of it being exploding before it even gets there and having to rebuild the whole thing again. So that, that's what's like really hard about space, but really cool, because the opportunity is so enormous that people are willing to take the risk to put that kind of money in to be able to get it up into space, right? And that, we're not even talking Mars, right? That, that is a whole different order of magnitude of capital to get something to Mars, right, than just into our orbit. So that's analytical space. So if they can unlock data coming down from the cloud and basically be the router from space, it will be enormously valuable to our planet and many, many different companies and organizations, including um, governments, to get that data. So Boston Metal. So this is something that was invented here at MIT out of a Professor Don Sadaway's lab. Has anybody ever met Professor Sadaway? He's a, he's a very famous professor here. You have, yes, OK, good. 3091, OK, great. Um, and he invented this technology. But essentially, it's in the advanced manufacturing space. Essentially, it's a way, and I'm not going to get into how he does it, um, a way to take uh, creating metals and electrify it. So if you think about reducing carbon in our atmosphere, taking coal-burning plants out of creating metals will make an enormous dent in our carbon footprint. So that is what this company does. And they also take, has anybody ever seen a steel plant? Or a picture of your mind of like Pittsburgh and what the, they're enormous because they have to be that big to make them economic. This would create a steel power plant that's tiny. It's kind of the size of this room. So it takes something that's like th two or three city blocks and puts it down into the size of this room. 
so that you could create metals almost anywhere. So that's another cool company. Um, Cambridge Crops. This is one that I think is very accessible. So how many of you have watched a peach, an apple, a strawberry, over, very rapidly over a day or two go bad in either your refrigerator or sitting out in a fruit bowl? How many have seen that? OK. So this is a technology that was de developed between MIT and Tufts University in, their, in the Silk Project program. And essentially, what they have created is a coating, so something that you could spray on fruits, vegetables, fish, meats, that would stop those things from respirating at the same rate, which would reduce, would increase the amount of time that they were at right, you know, pure ripe, ripeness, things you'd want to eat. So it's basically silk being sprayed on things to stop them from going bad. So this one um, just spun out of, uh, of Tufts, and they have rapidly proven this across almost everything we eat and are now in partnership with major food companies to do this. And much of the far carbon footprint is taken up by food that is produced that goes bad. So if the food doesn't go bad, good for all of us. There's more food to eat, but also less has to be produced. So that's a very, very good thing. Um, and maybe I'll take you through one more, and then we'll go to questions. So Commonwealth Fusion, also built here at MIT. Who's been over to the um, Plasma Fusion Center? One, two. Oh my god, we need a field trip. We need a field trip. OK. God, I don't know if we can stuff you all into the tokamak, but um, many of you are the right size. So does everybody know what a tokamak is? No? no? OK. I'm going to draw a picture. So I want you to imagine that kind of looks like a donut, right? OK. I mean, from the side, I'm trying to, I'm a terrible drawer. Imagine there are 12 donuts lined up like this in a circle. That's essentially, which creates a circle of donuts. If you create this thing right and pulse energy through it, essentially what you create is plasma, right? And um, no one has yet proven that we can draw net positive energy out of a fusion power plant. The world has been trying to prove this for a long time. MIT has come the closest of any group in the world in a plant that is literally a few feet away from here right now, which is like so amazing. So this company just spun out of MIT, and they believe they have the right design to create net positive energy. And I, I want you to think about this. Plasma, like what is surrounding stars, is a zero carbon footprint way of producing energy. And that would mean we could power our grid without producing any carbon if fusion were possible. And so this team is producing a company that we believe will, for the first time, have net positive energy and make fusion a reality. And that's going to happen here right around this campus. Um, and the first magnet of the tokamak, so these are all magnets. The first magnet of the tokamak will be done over the next couple of years. And if we can prove that, we know how to build tokamaks. We believe we can get to a true fusion power plant. And that will be outstanding for the world. So those are the types of things we're working on. And happy to take any questions and happy to talk about anything. Who wants, who wants to talk? Who's got an idea? Who's got a company they want to form? Anybody? Who's got an idea they want to talk about? Yes. Data analytics. OK, cool. What do you want to analyze? Stock market. OK. And. Um, so you want to do a hedge fund? Yeah. Um, what do you need to, to get that done? Um, I need an AI library. 
a, mach a machine learning software, um, some economic experts, and maybe past historical data. And what, what do you think is your edge? Because there's a lot of people with a data analytics platform who are trying to you know, figure out the stock market. So what do you think your edge is? Um, I'll try to use all possible historical data, like going all the way back to like when the first stock market began in the US. Yep. And probably comparing it to other countries and seeing their patterns, because a lot of patterns repeat. Like the boom and bust cycle has been like repeating. So you can probably predict like when the peak is going to be there and like when it's going to fall. So you should go try to find Andy Lowe, who's a professor here, if you want to talk that. Um, but my advice to you is go seek out a bunch of experts. Uh, because there are a lot of them certainly sitting around MIT who've thought about this, and many of them are over at the business school um, who combine technology and finance. Yeah. Okay, I got a question down here. Front row. Yeah, you. You want to collect all the energy from the sun. Oops, right here. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's awesome. How are we going to do that? Um, oh, I saw this from, you, from YouTube. Oops, into the mic. Oh, um, so I just watched this from YouTube, but like, I think like, it's possible to do it. It's like, it's like they're launching like, a, sh a shape like he hexagon. A and hexagon? So, and we just collect the energy and then like... Wait, come up here, come up here. Don't be afraid, come on. <laughs> Okay, so um, so we're gonna collect. Oh, okay, do we have to get all? Could we get like fifty percent? Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's start with fifty. Um, why do you want to do that? Um, because it's like enormous. First of all, the sun like has enormous. Uh, as enormous energy, and we we can use that for like anything. Like build, it would be it would be like much easier energy we can get, and like it would be like. It would be like common to use the energy, and we'll use it like for like rockets, like stuff like that. And it would be like more efficient to travel around this solar system with rockets, and we we won't we won't like we wouldn't care about the energy, like how how much we're wasting. I mean, like using. Yeah, because it's abundant and it's it's great. So, you know, solar energy is awesome. Okay, so what are the challenges to his idea? We need what? Okay, so, but let's just say he, it's possible. If I'm standing, okay, so I've got an enormous checkbook. He shows up. I'm going to capture half the e energy of the sun. It'll mean rocket ships can go without fuel. It'll mean all crops can grow, all these great things. And now what do I say to him? Well, how do you do that? So what do you think the challenges are to this? <laughs> Sun's far, but we are already captured it with solar energy, right? Solar panels, yes. <laughs> okay, so we've got, right. So the question is, where are you capturing it? Do you know where you're going to capture it? How close to the sun? Um, How far from the sun? So we're going to try to um, get close as we can from, like, apart from, Close as we can to the sun, and then um, it's like we're like it's like almost like starting a farm, just starting s simple system, um, growing from it, and then getting larger and larger, and then by the time we'll just be launching stuff like things. So we'll try okay, to catch. Okay, hold. You're doing great. Okay, what what else do we have to figure out? Yes, in the top. Right, so what's the thing that's collecting and it is, is that positive? Okay, what else do we have? Yes. Yep. Okay, what else? Yep. That's certainly one possibility. Okay, yes. Ah, can 
combustion. That's <laughs> okay. So hold on, hold for a minute. So here's the here's the game that you're gonna play for the next umpteen years of your life. You're sitting around going, wouldn't it be awesome if we could collect all the energy from the sun because we could do all these things? Your, or, or whatever it is, whatever your awesome huge idea is. Here's what happens when you talk to normal people. They say that's impossible. Your job and your only job is to not be that person. Don't be that person. That's, that's the easy way out is to say you're crazy or what I call in no. And oh, the really important, the most important skill of true creators in the world is to say yes and try to figure it out. Now, in saying yes, you're going to hone that idea, right? You're going to make it smaller, or you're going to make it bigger, or you're going to make it more feasible, or you're going to make it more explainable. But to be in yes, means that it's your job to make it better, not your job to say it's wrong. And I guarantee you, what divides the best makers in the world, the people who create things that solve problems, are that they stay in yes for a really long time and try to figure out how to make it possible and better. You know, think about our Commonwealth Fusion friends. Do you know how many people tell them, oh yeah, fusion, that's always 30 years away. If they listened to those people, they wouldn't go solve the problems, okay? So your job is when your friend here, what's your name? Um, Daniel. When your friend Daniel says, I'm building a, what's that? Did you say Daniel? No, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, sorry. <laughs> I'm in the old category, so. Um, when Nathaniel says, I'm going to build this thing, it's not, oh, no, you can't do that because it's going to melt the thing you build. You know, how are you going to collect it? Like, all the no's. Your thing is to be like, cool, Daniel. I mean, Nathaniel. <laughs> um, thank you. Another, yes, good job. Yes. I'm surprised that, at least from what I heard, no one talked about the radiation from the sun or the solar flares. Good point. So your job then, okay, so hold on. What's your name? Aaron. Aaron. Okay, so to be in yes is to say, that's such a cool idea, Nathaniel. We got to figure out a way to deal with the, the radiation. Exactly. Right, so you're flipping, you're flipping around your comment. Okay, who has another idea? We'll try this again. But if you talk, you have to be in yes. You have to be in how are you going to fix it. Come on down. You have an idea? Um, Come on down. I mean. Come on down. <laughs> so. What it's, do you got? It's not really like a super tough tech That's idea, but um, I'm really passionate about filmmaking and technology. So I wanted to find a way to like combine advances in like artificial intelligence and virtual reality in order to be able to like combat like mental health issues with um, using like filmmaking and virtual reality and things like okay, that. Okay, so if you succeed, what will the world look like? Well, um, I hope. Well, like it's kind of naive to say that the world would look like a place where like people struggle less with mental health issues and things. Um, Why is that special. naive? Absolutely <laughs> not naive. Yeah, but I would just hope That's for that. That's what you want to create yeah. is to reduce people's, through this technology, reduce how much people struggle with mental health. Yes. OK. Awesome. You, you can create that in the world. So the question is, OK, that's what she wants to do. Who can make that idea more real, more tangible, better? Who's got an idea to add to that? 
Ooh. Yes. You got to talk louder because I'm oh, half sorry. deaf. Um, I was just thinking, as for virtual reality, maybe you can make it completely immersive so that people can understand different perspectives. And then I think that would be good in terms of like understanding what others are doing. Oh, so just like not just having like a headset and controllers, but to have like a completely immersive experience. That's okay, cool. so that is a beautiful example of a yes answer. Here's a possible way we could get to something that could amplify your idea. Okay, who's next? Yes, here. You gotta talk super loud. Cool. Who else can add to this idea? Yes. You, yellow shirt or green shirt. I don't know what color that is. Yeah. Um, you could uh, try to do like telehealth therapy by um, kind of just making it like a video chat or phone call or something and trying to prove it with the virtual reality by making it more immersive. Awesome. One more. Yes. Okay, what's your name? Uh, Emily. Okay, Emily, do you really want to work on this idea? Yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Very much so. So um, who in this room will commit right now that when Emily is thinking about this, that they will be a partner in yes and how to get it done? Who will encourage Emily and help her think through it? Okay, those are all your friends in this idea. Thank you. Katie, uh, would you open to uh, Emily and her team coming and pitching the idea to you at the end of the program? Absolutely, come and pitch. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So, Emily, if you want to, we'll find the time for you to and pitch the idea to Katie. Happy to have you guys come and pitch at the engine. No problem. How much more? Okay, hold on. Um, so, do yes. That's an awesome question. So the question is, you guys seem less focused than many incubators where, that are like just biotech or something like that. How do you deal with that? What is your staff like that you need to deal with that? Um, so when we think of tough tech, we go across so many different areas. And the reason we made that choice is that we think there's more similarities between all these different industries than differences when you're dealing with things that have physical instantiation, things that, that you can feel and touch. And every area that we deal with has some kind of physical instantiation, which means that, um, that you need people, in order to do something like that, though, you need people that both understand the different industries you're going after, but also a very wide set of engineering. And so when we put a team together, we assembled a group of people that had all different skill sets across the engineering disciplines. So whether that's biological engineering, chemical engineering, physics, chemistry. And, and so if you look at our team, we all come from those different backgrounds. But more importantly, we chose people who had had to bridge across a number of industries in their career. So they were unafraid to create and understand a new discipline and unafraid to understand a different industry. 
So nobody in our team has just been in one industry or one engineering or science discipline. And that is the magic of it is, is the fearlessness, but also the humility to know that they don't understand everything and that it's their job to learn in these different disciplines. So that's the kind of team you have to assemble to tackle something like this. And then we surround ourselves with experts. Yes. Yes. We, in fact, have done that. Um, but we have to believe that what you have is a true breakthrough. And many of those things don't happen because you don't have enough time in your undergrad. It, we, are, we are all for, we don't care about age. It's, it's not about age for us. It's about what's the breakthrough? How did you get to it? Can you form a team around you that will bring it all the way to market? And so sometimes it takes more time than that to get there. But that's, that has nothing to do with not, I mean, the, we have one team that I think the founder was 19 when we invested into that company. Uh, and he invented it on his own. So it's, but we thought it was awesome. And so we invested. Yeah. But in general, it takes longer. Yes. You know, the sad, the sad fact of the matter is in any what venture capital portfolio, you will have failure. There's, there's literally no way around it. Um, what happens to most companies when they fail, and there are different forms of failure. There's um, absolute failure, like the engineering, you could not get the thing to work. So that's a real technical failure. Often those companies just blow apart and everybody goes their separate ways and they go into other companies. The, most of the people working there get scooped up by other people because they're great scientists or engineers or business people and they go on their merry way to the next startup. Um, there's a different form where like the technology worked but it's a market failure. They could not figure out the market. And often those companies get bought. So you could technically think of them as a failure, um, or you could think of them as a failure because their business didn't succeed, but somebody else thought that technology was really valuable. Uh, so they get acquired by a different company. And then the winners are the ones that like both make the tech and the business work. You know? but, but in my mind, the startup world, it always seems really risky to people or to like your grandparents. But in general, what you see is companies form, they either make it or they don't, and all of those people, if they don't make it, if the company doesn't make it, get scooped up by the next company. Because startup people have a skill set of knowing how to start something from nothing and creating value out of nothing. And so they often reform into a new team. And that, that's what's exciting and not as risky as people think. Yeah. Yes. What are they? Is it something that develops over time? Are you born with it? Can you learn more? That's such a great question. Uh, I do think people are born with innate skills um, and or proclivities things that, that are easy for them to develop and things that are harder. Like think about any high school class. Like some of you are probably, like math might come really easy to you, but to stand up and have to act out a play feels really awkward and weird and it would take a lot of practice for you to be great at that, right? So what I mean is, you know, most people have a few skills that come very naturally and you just have to push a little and they become great at something. And others have to work on many. I'm talking about the three or four attributes that come very easily to you. But I think almost all attributes are developable in, in a startup setting. Um, so I'll give you some of them. I didn't mean to say there were only 10, but roughly. But there's all kinds of, you know, there's leadership ability 
And you know, there's subcategories of that, whether it's technical or business or group. Like, those are all different kinds of leadership abilities. I think those are very, very developable. You know, there's technical expertise and agility, right? Like, I'm sure you've met friends that are just, like, it, it, has anybody done FIRST Robotics? OK, I figured there would be a few of you in this room. Um, right, you're on one of those teams, and you're like, how did my friend figure that out so easily? Like, they're just technically gifted, and they figure things out really quickly, whereas you, maybe it takes a little longer on certain things. So there are people with like real technical gifts that they can also develop, but they are born with some of those as well, right? And so I think in all of these attributes, and I'm not going to lay them all out, you know, you have innate, but many of those are developable. And then you have things that are just going to be harder for you. I think in life, people tend, it, the successful people tend to focus on the things that they are gifted at and that they can easily contribute. And then we all have to work on the things that are hard for us. But if you focus your life on things that come naturally to you to do, it's a lot easier. Um, and so I just tr try to look at who's naturally gifted in different ways and make sure that the team needs those natural gifts, right? So often, you'll get a company where everybody looks the same. Like three people out of a mechanical engineering department forming a company, and they're all really gifted mechanical engineers. I say to myself, well, where's the rest of the team? Right? Who, who likes to make sales calls? Who likes to understand the customer? Who likes to you know, make sure that everything's organized? It might be one of these three people, and it might not. And if they, if they don't have everything they need to create the company, I try to make sure that they find other humans that fill out, fill that out. Does that make sense? That's, that's what I was trying to get at. OK, way in the back. Yeah. I mean, gifted is a loaded term, right, especially in this group. But um, uh, uh, what I think most great like seriously great entrepreneurs are very, very good at is truly understanding a vision for their company. They know what they want to create in the world. They don't, OK, like, I want to collect all the sun's energy. They, they know that. They may not know the full path there, but they have such a compelling vision of the future that people follow them to create it. And there are many great examples of people like that. Um, but it is that, mag you know, that magnetic quality, that vision that truly pull, inspires and pulls people toward them that I think really distinguishes the good from the great. And if I had to pick a singular quality, it would be that. Yeah. Yes. That would be pretty cool. So if you could reflect some of the sun's energy to Mars so that people could live. Well, there you go. There's your startup idea. Who do you need on your team to figure that out? OK. Are there space scientists here? A few. Yeah. Right. OK, it sounds like you need to have lunch. Talk about this. I think we have time for one more. OK, great. Somebody who hasn't asked a question. We in back. Wait. Yep, right here. Louder. Sorry. Solving technologies that can't, or 
solving problems that can't be solved today. So we just made our first quantum investment. Uh, I believe we are well on our way to having, you know, true quantum computers that can solve problems. I think in the next five years, you're going to see an explosion. I, I don't think it's 10. Um, you know, in this region, in, at Harvard and MIT, I would say are some of the best quantum scientists in the world who are working on the next generation of quantum computers that I think are going to blow all of your minds away. And um, that, you know, f five years from now, we're going to be in a whole different re realm with quantum. So what year in school are you? You're a rising senior. So are you going to study physics or quantum? I think it's a great idea. I think you'll graduate into a hot market. I'm just predicting. I have no idea, but I'm predicting. Yes. Um, so you work at a venture capital fund, and I was wondering if you think the single most effective way to make the world a better place is by having lots of money. I actually, you know what, I, I kind of grew up trying to ignore money. And my personal opinion is money is the, such an important tool to creating amazing things in the world. And you have to be able to get money to the right things. And I think early stage venture capital is the way to do that. And so that is why I've built my career doing that, is that you have to be able to convince people that if you put money into the right places, both the world is better and you will generate more money. And so I, I think of that as a really, really important thing. It, it's also the single most powerful tool to create next generation jobs. And um, so not only impact the world, but local jobs. So I think of it as one of the greatest um, economic development tools as well. Okay, I think uh, she will be here for a little. She'll be here for a little longer. So let's hold up. Let's. Let's give Katie a big yes for next time somebody poses a problem. So let's hear it. One, two, three. Yes. All right. Not too bad. <laughs>